Welcome to this four part tutorial series where we'll build this uh, two dimensional sound exploration patch together. Um, we're going to cover a few workflows, uh, including sound segmentation, audio descriptor analysis, uh, data storage and retrieval, as well as using uh, a wide breadth of objects from the Flucoma toolkit in Max. In this first tutorial, we're just gonna look at the segmentation part of the problem. And in the further tutorials, we'll break down each part of the patch and iteratively build upon what was done in the previous tutorial. By the end of the tutorial series, we hope that you feel comfortable or more comfortable using the Flucoma toolkit. Um, as we cover lots of different aspects of how the objects fit together with each other, as well as how they fit together more broadly with uh, the objects in Max that you know and love. So let's get into patching this first part. So to kick things off, I'm going to start by making a buffer called sound. And what it's going to hold is an audio file. This audio file is a drum loop that comes with the Flicoma package. So if you use this name uh, and the package is installed correctly, Max will be able to find it and you'll have something like this in there. So if I make a play object, point it to my buffer, loop it, add a toggle, add a DAC. And hit play. we get a sense of what that sound is like. And so just to remind you, the idea is we want to segment this sound file. We, know, we want to know where some kind of change happens um, so that we can chop the file up into little bits. So to start on that task, we'll experiment with the onset slice object. Now this is a slicer which uh, looks at the differences between consecutive spectral frames. So it's good for generic slicing tasks where you don't really know exactly what you're looking for. Um, and when you use it with the metric nine uh, parameter, the threshold goes between zero and one, which is quite nice. Um, so it makes it quite simple to use. Um, so what we can do is actually before I do that, we're just going to have a look at the scope. So these, these slicing objects take a signal in and they give us a signal out. And if we have a look, you can see occasionally it spikes, creates a signal spike. Um, and what this signifies is that it's detected some kind of change. Um, and the reason it's a spike and not a bang is because it's quite useful for doing lots of signal driven processes where we don't have to change between control rate an audio rate, um, um, as well as making it uh, more accurate in time. It's also handy that we can just put the spike into our DAC and listen to it. So on the left, you'll hear the drums and on the right, you'll hear when the slices happen. So it's quite good. Uh, to my ears, I hear some snare hits, some kick hits, some hi-hat hits, and aligned with those, I hear these spikes which say, hey, there's a segment. This is the start of an onset. We could, uh, if we wanted to make this output here trigger something else, we can use the edge object to convert it into a bang. So that's the interface for the real-time slicing. Um, and it's really nice if we want to audition how a slicer works and just hear it quite quickly. But if we want to process a whole buffer, um, we use the sibling object, the buff on set slice, which instead of using a real-time signal, we'll use a buffer as the input. And it shares the same name except for the buff prefix. And it shares all the same parameters as well. 
the difference is instead of giving it the signal as I said before we give it a buffer or a source or an input to look at in this case it's my buffer called sound and then we give it an output where it's going to give us some information that tells us where the start of slices are and in this case it's an indices uh, this is the name of the attribute and we give it a name so I'm going to call it slice points and then I have to create a buffer that has that name so what it's going to say is slice the sound buffer and give me the results in the slice points buffer so we're going from a buffer to a buffer if I put a bang here and a bang here this bang will tell the object to start processing and we'll get a bang back when it's done so it's going to happen quite quickly and if we have a look in the buffer we can see some stuff is in there but it's not particularly helpful um, so you might be used to seeing only sound files in buffers um, but if you're a super collider user or a pure data user, you'll be more used to using um, buffers on the server and arrays as sort of generic containers to just put any kind of data or just numerical data. Um, and so we treat them like that in Max, although it's not always the convention. Um, and certain uh, views like this one are not particularly helpful. So in, in reality, this buffer here is full of a bunch of numbers which tell us exactly in time where it thinks the start segments are. Now to get this information out, um, we can quickly do that with this object, buff to list. We give it an input buffer. And what it's going to do is it's going to convert all of the numbers, the numerical data stored in this buffer, to a list. So you can see here, these are the start times in audio samples at which a segment has been detected. And we can use this information in lots of different ways. Uh, one way might be to make our own kind of granular chopper type patch. Um, and we can quickly realize that with Groove. So if I make a Groove object and point it to my sound buffer, and I'll make it loop. And I'll put a gain down the bottom to be good. Oops, it's not a stereo file, is it? And then I'll attach a signal. So the groove object now is looping around our sound buffer, but What's quite handy is Groove has two inputs, the loop min and the loop max. And they allow us to shift the portion of the buffer that it plays back and loops around. Um, and we can use these slice points here to dictate those positions. So because everything is in a buffer, we can use all of our friendly objects in max that deal with buffers. Um, so peak, and I'll just stop this. So we can use peak to grab that information, extract it from the buffer. If I just put it over here for a bit more room, put it down here and I make an integer box and we have a look at the output. We can see that I'm looking up the zeroth or the very first number in the buffer. So there's something uh, along here, which is 1536. I look, can look up the next one by incrementing this index here. So I go to one, which is the second, because of a zero counting. And you can see it's just counting through those, those numbers and we're extracting them as a number in max. Now what I want to do is take pairs of numbers which dictate the start and end of a segment. And so we can consider each number here uh, in pairs to get that. So what we say is 1, 5, 3, 6 and 8, 1, 9, 2. That's a segment. 
38192 and 38912, that's a segment. And so if we just make a pair of slice point peaks and do a plus one here, what this is going to do is look up zero, so the first one, and one together. So we get our starts and ends of our buffers. And the only problem is we're, we're in audio samples here and we need to be in milliseconds. So we can use our samps to milliseconds object. While I was making this video, there was a caveat that I forgot to mention. SAMPS to MS converts the input by dividing that value by the sampling rate and multiplying it by a thousand. It discerns the sampling rate by using whatever is currently set in Max's audio preferences. This can be problematic because the buffer that we segmented before might be at another sampling rate. SAMPS to MS will only be reliable if Max's sampling rate is the same as the buffer which you are working with. To solve this problem, you can do the conversion yourself and remove the SAMPS to MS object. One approach is to use the info object to get the sampling rate of the buffer and then use that with the formula in an expert object. You can see this on the screen now. And what that's going to do is change where the groove object looks in our source buffer here. Turn this up a little bit. So you can hear the slices that it's detected. So that's one way of playing with the, uh, with the slices, um, hearing the result of the process. As well, um, you could use it to build a synth from that kind of drum looper. Uh, a drum remixer of some description, or just a, a sound remixer based on segmenting it and then reassembling it. Um, I think it's also good to show you another object called Fluid Waveform, which is actually a JSUI abstraction. Um, but this is really, really useful. And excuse this small bug, if you want to visualize slices and where they start. So, we provide a buffer, which is our sound, and it draws it for us, and we can resize it. We can also add markers. And so we provide the, the message markers, the name of a buffer containing some slice points, and we have to give the sample rate of the original buffer. But if we do that, we get some lines which tell us where those slice points were detected, which is really useful uh, if we want to quickly visually inspect the results. So if I just get rid of this message box and I get rid of this, because looking at numbers is not that helpful all the time. What I'm going to make this do is every time we slice, it updates the fluid waveform. And what we can do is play with things like changing the threshold. So if we change this to, we can make it as low as possible, zero. And then I reprocess. You can see we have more slices. And if I go back to my audition object here, You can hear they're much smaller than when they were before. And we could go back to a higher threshold, so a coarser segmentation.
So that's how you can segment a sound, look at the slices, the result, and also play back the sound using the segments um, as information for the to drive this playback process.